discussion on open on ICT standardization system reform. Um, my name is Aslam Rafi. I'm from uh, the Government IT Officers Council, um, Open Standards and Open Source Standing Committee, the Government of South Africa. Uh, with me on the panel, I have Bob Jalaf, who represents um, the Department of Science and Technology at the OASIS, uh, OASIS Committee on ODF. Uh, technical standards as well as uh, ODF Next. Um, Bob will also um, give us a bit of a background in his involvement in ISO and uh, representing the government of South Africa um, at ISO as well as SABS. Um, next, uh, um, we've got three speakers. Uh, coming after Bob will be Sunil Abraham um, and He'll give us a bit of a background in terms of his organization and his involvement in uh, open standards. And our last speaker representing a business perspective on open standards is Ashish Gautam, who comes from IBM. Uh, Bob, if you would start your presentation. Um, each speaker will have 20 minutes, and then we will have, uh, well, we were hoping to have uh, 20 minutes, but I guess that's uh, uh, half an hour, but that bring, comes down to 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. But if I could ask the speakers to keep it uh, as close to 15 minutes as possible, uh, that will give us more time for questions and answers. Uh, Bob, if you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aslam. Um, I think the, the problem of time is pretty well taken care of because if I'm lucky, I've got about 15 minutes battery life on my laptop here. So. Um, yeah, I say, my name is Bob Jolliffe. Uh, I just prepared a short slide here. It's not really who is Bob, but it's more about why, why is Bob here. <laughs> um, just to kind of put some cards on the table, I suppose. I've been funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation to attend this event. Um, I've really been part of with, and I've really been hoping that we'll get some input from there. Um, as Aslam said, I, I represented the Department of Science and Technology at, at SABS, the South African Bureau of Standards. Um, I was also the SABS expert delegate, if you like, to the ISO SC34 plenaries, which are basically discussing um, the OXML uh, uh, 29500 standard earlier this year and last year. And I'm also currently still representing the department as the representative on the OASIS Office Technical Committee. So I know a little bit about OASIS, I know a little, I've learned a little bit about where ISO SC34 works, I've learned a little bit about the way SABS works, and I think the opportunity I'm trying to take here is to try to reflect on some of the learnings of um, that experience, rather than to go rehashing over all the old arguments. Um, the title of the, of the workshop was about reform of ICT standardization, and I guess the first question one needs to ask is, um, is there really a problem? Um, what is it that we're talking about reforming? Um, where is the problem, if there is one? And if there is, what might we be doing about it? Well, kind of, in answer to the first question, I guess, is there a problem of legitimacy? I guess uh, these people in the street <laughs> in April in Oslo obviously thought so. This was a uh, demonstration outside the SC34 plenary meeting that was just happening off the street there, um, following the the approval of of um, the DIS 29500 specification through ISO last year. And I think it was clear at the end of that process. However, whatever the merits of the end result might be, and I certainly have got very strong views on on that. But whatever the merits of the end of the result might be, it's clear that there was deep unhappiness and questioning that went into the, the kind of retrospection which happened afterwards. Um, and essentially, I think there's a, it's a problem of legitimacy um, which international standards organizations need to address if they're to bear this international label, if you like. And I don't think really there's any perfectly good examples out there I think, I think that different, different standards bodies have got different strengths and weaknesses. Um, and uh, I think there is an opportunity at this stage while we're reflecting on, on, on these things to perhaps try to learn from some of the best practices. Uh, one of the kind of concerns that, that were exposed by this process, um, I think the unprecedented size of the specification that was submitted through a fast track process um, 
revealed, I think, that the process that was designed for for standardizing of, of a particular kind of standard, a particular type of standard, and even a particular length of standard, um, with a particular sort of level of participation, wasn't really appropriate in this case. In which, in which case, I think one can con con conclude that there's a need to think about new processes, perhaps, which, um, amongst other things, uh, are geared towards allowing, first of all, more greater public interest, because clearly there was a public interest thing here, but also dealing with, with the kind of mechanical problems of how you actually uh, realistically go through such, a, such a, a size of specification. There was an unprecedented degree of participation by developing countries. Now, this is a really, th really interesting point to raise as a concern, because I think part of some of the discussion I've been hearing this week has all been around um, how to get greater participation of developing countries. Um, I think that this is sort of a double-edged sword because one of the really positive benefits of this process, I believe, is that a lot of countries which were not traditionally participants in these kind of processes actually became participants. And I think there, there, there is something positive to take out of that. On the other hand, the opportunity for, for gaming the system um, in terms of, of, of using national body votes as proxies um, is something that to, one needs to be, be careful of. And I've got a few comments on that lower down. There was an unprecedented objection to the process by a number of countries. And I know certainly South Africa and Brazil, I think, were founder members of ISO, and, and they, they wouldn't lodge such protests very lightly. Um, the fact that there was this objection to process um, indicates a problem. And I think probably many of you may have heard there were various complaints by various civil society groups, technical committees within national standard bodies, particularly within a number of European countries, um, making complaints against their own national body. I believe that the Monopolies Commission in the, in the EU also um, decided to cast an eye over the process as well. Um, I think part of the problem, certainly part of the concern, uh, part of the concern that was raised was this whole issue of what's being called kind of standardization by corporation. And in this case, um, I don't want to kind of, yeah. In this case, it was one corporation, one particular private interest. It could have been any. This is not a particularly sort of focused attack on Microsoft, if you like. In this case, it was uh, a Microsoft-sponsored standard. But it could be any large corporation. The principle is is, is one to be concerned about. And Martin Bryan, who was the, the, the ISA SC34 working group chair, working group two, which was responsible for dealing with, with precisely the, the um, um, process of DIS 29500, actually made this comment when he, he, when he retired um, in some kind of desperation, I suspect, that the disparity of rules for past fast track and ISO committees generated standards is fast making ISO a laughing stock in IT circles. I think that was a major concern by members of the committee that um, their credibility and their, their legitimacy was being called into question. And he said that the days of open standards development are fast disappearing. Instead, we are getting standardization by corporations, something I've been fighting against for the 20 years I've served on ISO committees. I think this is the, one of the, the primary concerns that um, emerged various stages throughout the process. Uh, ISO, like, like most standards organizations, are member-driven organizations. And perhaps part of the problem might be the same pro problem that Peter Dreos identified regarding WIPO. He said the problem with WIPO is that most developing countries send their IP office reps to its meetings. And the IP office reps were already kind of bought into the system. Um, I think that regarding ISO, who gets sent to ISO meetings and on what basis is a question that needs to be asked. And it's a question, unfortunately, which there's no universal answer to because different national bodies within the sort of ISO family uh, operate completely autonomously or independently of one another. Uh, but there certainly should be, at this point, a fairly rich history of best practice from national bodies which we should be reflecting on. And I think it's about national bodies acquiring greater national legitimacy um, in order to be able to better represent national interests um, at uh, international forums. Um, one of the things that I think featured quite strongly in the South African national body um, deliberations on this thing uh, 
was quite a strong level of participation from governments and academia and NGOs um, beyond the, the more traditional participation of vendors. A lot of people still think that the process of standardization um, is a process where vendors get together in order to be able to uh, strike bargains in order to be able to better interoperate with one another. And I think there's an aspect of that is true. But there's certainly a need, and I think people like Andy Uptergrove have identified some kinds of standards um, have some sort of publicness or civil importance to them, which means that there are stakeholders involved who are not simply vendors. Um, the, I think part of the problem in many developing country offices is that frequently there isn't that capacity there, either within government or within NGO or within academia. And so those offices are very easily um, uh, influenced by uh, private companies who may be able to come in and say, well, look, we can represent you and your national interests very well at um, in international forums. Um, so I think there are particular problems relating to the, the governance of, of national body offices in developing countries, which we can, again, perhaps learn from one another. Um, a lot of people have said that this recent, this recent interest fetishism of open standards that we've been hearing about in the last year is really perhaps, perhaps uh, a proxy for other issues. And I think to a certain extent that's true. Uh, we talk a lot about open standards and people, the proliferation of definitions of open standards I'm sure um, um, people are well aware of. Um, but underlying a lot of the concerns around standardization, in fact, turn out to be concerns around IPR as well. Um, one of the, the observations I've certainly found, I always thought that the, the disclosure form that you fill in when you join an ISO, an ISO committee is a full disclosure form where there's a place where you list the patents that may be relevant to the standards under discussion. It seems that increasingly that is not the case. Certainly over the last sort of four or five years, one sees across a number of committees that um, instead of disclosing individual patents, what, what, what is being submitted is simply a blanket um, uh, covenant or promise or what have you, um, not to make use of whatever patents you might have. I think the purpose of those disclosure forms is disclosure, and I think it's, it's unfortunate that we're not doing that. Um, I think another problem which emerges, and, and maybe if there's people here with experience in other standards organizations, would be interesting to get a comment on, but it seems that whereas standards organizations are being asked to address so this patent licensing problem, but I mean, frequently they are neither enthusiastic nor even able to provide any kind of guarantees around, around how patent-free a standard might be. Um, they're both not enthusiastic to be conducting patent searches and also uh, whereas you may get agreement from members of, of who are participating in committees, there are obviously third parties who may not be part of that committee who may still um, hold patents which are essential for, for implementing a standard. Um, the, I think another problem is that international standards um, have this kind of international scope but they're overlaid uh, over national and uh, a great deal of national regional diversity of IPR regimes. I tell you what we found in South Africa, because in South Africa we've got a we've got a registration only patent office. So we've got many patents. To get a patent in South Africa is really easy. It costs you about three hundred dollars, I think. Um, possibly I think about thirty dollars. Three hundred rand. Thirty dollars. You come and you pay your thirty dollars, you submit your spec. Um, it sits for a surprisingly long time and then it gets a stamp on it and it's issued. So as a consequence, in South Africa, we, we face quite particular problems because we had patents filed in our office which were not filed anywhere else in the world. So for us, looking at these covenants and promises and what have you wasn't a, a, a abstract exercise about some patents that may be in the system. We had concrete examples which concerned us. Um, I've got sort of two slides of, sort of my own thoughts about possible recommendations in, the, in this area, which... Um, they're just thoughts. I think there may be many, many more thoughts coming from the rest of the panel and, and, and from members of the audience. I think, first of all, the level of financial transparency um, should be increased considerably. Um, I found, for example, that for the South African Bureau of Standards to, to for a subcommittee of SABs to have uh, participatory membership status on an ISO committee actually costs a fair amount of money. And so SABs will evaluate whether it is worthwhile for a country, etc., to make, to, to put up that money. Um, 
when we saw the sort of proliferation, the large number of countries who were suddenly taking part um, in ISO committees with P member status, it's got to raise the question, I think, where does the money come from? Um, and I think th those kind of questions are really very easily solved if you have a level of transparency. I think at another level, um, what the contributions are of different national bodies into the ISO, the IEC, or what have you, I think those kind of questions, um, those kind of transparencies are fairly easy to implement and would open things considerably. Modernizing of processes, I think this is, this is something that's been really surprising. I mean, uh, standards bodies filled with experts working on, on, on the, some of the more technical and detailed aspects of, of, of computer technologies generally don't really make use of them, particularly in terms of the way that they operate. Um, certainly the South African Bureau of Standards is using, is using ICT particularly um, um, weakly, I think. I think the, 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 the ISO themselves, for example, rely a lot on these face-to-face -face meetings, which can cause a problem for developing country participation, again, unless you've got some financing which needs to be transparent, etc. The, the way that SC34 has worked is that there's, there, there are face-to-face -face meetings typically twice a year, which, which bounce typically between, between East and West. There will be a meeting in Europe, there will be a meeting in Asia, there will be a meeting in Europe, and it would bounce backwards and forwards. Wherever it is, it's, it's hugely expensive to come from South Africa. Um, and um, obviously other places as well. A lot of business can and does take place in, in other organizations which rely much more on, on a simple telephone conference. Um, uh, I think a lot of Web2 web, web technologies we've yet to see, but to be the, the, the kind of collaboration, and a lot of the web is about collaboration, and yet an area which really needs good collaborative tools, like we see in standards bodies, um, we don't see the the, the appropriate technology being used. I think there's a serious need to ask the question about a regulation of proportional influence of, of private interests. Um, I know within, within ISO there's a kind of a, an anathema towards this notion of block voting. If kind of four or five countries get together and try to share a common platform on something, it's viewed harshly because it goes against the principle of technical discussion and et cetera, et cetera. And yet, uh, when you have the possibility of multinational companies effectively representing uh, 20 or 30 different countries, um, I think uh, it's potentially problematic. I would like to see, and I've certainly suggested this to the South African Bureau of Standards, that if it's a company which is, which is um, not a wholly owned South African company, then they really shouldn't have a vice um, as far as representing a South African national position. And I think um, other national bodies could do the, could do the same on this. I'd, I'd say the United States, for example, would be quite distressed if uh, their national body positions on things was determined by Indian ICT companies. Um, I think, as I've mentioned before, we need to learn and adopt some of the best practices and the diversity of practices of national bodies around the world and certainly of other standard development organizations. Some of those best practices um, Relating, for example, uh, to, to IPR policies, I've, I've been particularly struck by the usefulness, I think, of the OASIS IPR policy, where essentially we know there may be some committees who are working on a standard which they're happy to release under RAND terms. There are other committees who would like to work on a committee which would like to work on IPR, on, on, on royalty-free terms. Um, it's fairly straightforward to have a mechanism. The way OASIS does it, I think this link goes somewhere. Let me just quickly check. Uh, I hope this link goes somewhere. Ha, if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Let me go back. Oh, no, here it comes. On Oasis, in Oasis, I know they take into account this possibility that, that um, uh, different committees might want to work with different forms of IPR policy. Um, it makes it simple f to identi identify, for example, we, we know there are a number of, of entities and states and organizations which have an understanding of open standards requiring royalty-free terms. I know we can argue the thing, but there are entities which have that requirement. Um, it's really important to be able to easily know whether a committee is working on, on specifications which conform to that particular requirement or not. And so, for example, on, on OASIS, 
on the front page or near the front page, a click away from the front page of every technical committee that's on there, there's a simple statement to say that this TC operates under the RF under limited terms mode or uh, under whatever other modes there might be. So within Oasis, there's a variety of different, of different um, licensing agreements that you can ask of members. And it should be fairly obvious to, to people looking at, at those committees which licensing terms they're operating under. Um, in terms of searching for patents, I, I, I've, I've made the point that you know, standards development organizations are really quite reluctant um, to engage in, in this, but there are people who do patent searches anyway. Um, when, when somebody submits a patent through, through WIPO and there's an international search report, I think it could be really, really useful if, if WIPO in production of that international search report as part of its searching of prior art actually also search the standards databases and have a little field in there. As a result of the, of the, of the, the search that's been done, we can say that this patent um, may impact upon the following standard, W3C, this, OASIS, that, ISO, IAC, what have you. Um, things like the peer to patent community process, community patent review, sorry, I, I used an acronym because I was running out of space. One minute. Uh, People who are engaged in, in, in patent searches generally, people in national examiners' manuals which define how, how um, patent searches take place, could and should include examination of, of standards databases. I think, as I mentioned already, a requirement, a return to the requirement for full disclosure, again, I think, again, would be really very, very useful. And the last point I actually made first, that there's things which standards bodies can do to make the, first of all, to make it flexible in terms of what kind of standard modes committees want to work on, but also to make it much clearer as to whether we're talking about an open standard in terms of RF terms or, or otherwise. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks very much. I'll look forward to questions now or after? Uh, we'll take all the questions afterwards. Okay. Uh, next, we'll have Sunil Abraham. Uh, Sunil will introduce himself. Um, uh, thanks, Bob, for that presentation. I think um, <coughs> Rob highlighted the need for a open and vendor-neutral standards body, and I think that is, as he um, highlighted, it's coming from this change, I believe, from a supplier-driven need to, stat to set standards to a user-driven need. Um, I think a huge concern for Bob uh, was uh, IPR issues, and I think we have two sets of problems. We have problems around the national bodies and their processes, and then we have um, problems around the standards bodies themselves in terms of transparency, credibility, and legitimacy. Um, so I, I, I'm uh, looking forward to some uh, good questions to Bob from the audience um, when we open the session to questions. Uh, Sunil? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Since uh, Bob gave a full disclosure, I also feel a bit obliged to do so. Uh, around 10 years ago, I started a free software company in Bangalore called Mahiti. Uh, today, we are a 67 engineer strong company. Uh, around four years ago, I joined UNDP at the Bangkok regional office to head a regional program called uh, International Open Source Network. Basically, we were using the UN brand to push for greater adoption of free and open source software, open standards, and open content in 42 countries from Iran to Fiji. And about four months ago, along with a group of colleagues and with the support of Kusuma Trust, uh, I have started a new NGO in Bangalore called Center for Internet and Society, which will have uh, advocacy activities in the area of open IPR alternatives. Uh, Throughout my career, both in the private sector and also uh, in the nonprofit sector and with uh, the UN, I have never taken the position of a free software fundamentalist or what you will call the free software Al-Qaeda. Yeah. I think there is a space in the world for both open and proprietary technologies. Just as uh, citizens have a right to buy products based on open standards, they have an equal right to purchase uh, products and services based on uh, closed standards. So uh, both rights are equally valid. But some organizations, organizations that are supported by taxpayers' money, 
especially the government, publicly funded organizations and NGOs, should uh, adopt uh, free and open source software, open standards, and open content policies uh, wherever appropriate, because these decisions directly impact quality of cit citizenship in uh, each country. So to draw an, an another analogy, just like in a city, it's important for us to have uh, private homes so that I can live in my home and you can live in your home. It's also important for us to have common public infrastructure like roads so that we can travel from, so that I can travel from my home to your home. Uh, in the previous uh, DECO session uh, on open standards, one of the speakers uh, was talking about the role of government in standards, whether the government should be a developer of standards, a regulator of standards, or a user of standards. And here I'd like to tell you a story uh, from my time at the International Open Source Network. We got support from Intel and IBM to organize uh, a research project on open standards policies and government interoperability frameworks. So I went to NIC and spoke to a senior government official, uh, trying to ask him to participate in the project. Aslam was uh, part of that research project. So he said, uh, so now IBM and uh, Intel are promoting open standards? That's very funny. Uh, many years ago, they were telling us that we should adopt ANSI SQL you should go and ask them who killed ANSI SQL. So I, I think uh, everybody uh, in, in the whole corporate sector is equally to blame. It's not just Microsoft. In my presentation, I will say several things about Microsoft. Uh, but I think there are several corporations in the ICT infrastructure who have contributed to the confusing position that we are in. So I would propose that governments should use open standards as a tool for market correction. Uh, and the best example of this is the SCOSTA story from India. SCOSTA stands for Smart Card Operating System for Transport Applications. It's an open standard. Uh, the situation before the open standard was introduced was that there were only three foreign vendors of smart cards, and the price of smart cards was rupees 600 per smart card. After the open standard was introduced by the government and mandated, the situation completely changed. The price of the smart card dropped to rupees 30, and the number of eligible vendors uh, increased from 3 to 12, with 8 indigenous vendors. So if the government notices a monopoly situation in an area that affects citizenship, then the government should, where it can, use open standards as a lever to fix the monopoly situation. Now just a quick reminder about the relationship between open source and open standards. Uh, they're not really connected, as many of the proprietary software vendors and their lobbyists will say. But there is one clear and definite connection, which is that open standards, open source is the test, is like a litmus test for whether a standard is truly open. And uh, as Simon Phipps from Sun Microsystem says, it is really the canary in the coal mine for open standards. Uh, now I'll share some stories about the process, uh, I mean some of the stories that we have heard in the media and also on the blogosphere about the national committees in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So I'll give you some stories from India, Pakistan, and Malaysia. In India, um, it, the Indian Linux user group Delhi claims that NGOs were requested to send form letters. This is in context of the OXML process. So NGOs were requested to send form letters to the Indian IT secretary and the additional director of the Bureau of Indian Standards. So NGOs were brought into the process. There was an attack by Microsoft on Professor D.B. Patak of IIT uh, then IIT Mumbai, and they basically accused him of taking an anti-national position. But if you actually look at the uh, pattern of voting, it's very strange. Most of the Indian IT companies uh, voted for OXML, and it was actually the foreign multinationals that uh, sided with the government organizations 
and the academic organizations in voting against OOXML. Now from Pakistan, uh, this is from a gentleman who works for the Pakistan Software Export Board. He says that the IT ministry was not even aware that Pakistan was involved in the OOXML process. They didn't know that Pakistan was on the list of participating OP countries. Uh, the Pakistan Standards and Quality Control Authority, working with the Ministry of Science and Technology, took the decision with Microsoft in the room, four uh, Microsoft Gold Partners, and Academia, Civil Society, and free and open source software companies were kept completely out of the process. From Malaysia, the Malaysian Industrial Standards Committee for IT, uh, with a majority of 81 percent voted to disapprove, but then the Minister for Science, Technology and Innovation overruled the committee's decision. And Malaysia finally voted to abstain. And just uh, two weeks ago, we hear news that the same minister has helped engineer an MOU between Microsoft Malaysia and MIMOS. MIMOS is the publicly owned software development agency, a bit like uh, CDAC and NIC in the Indian context. And what this MOU is going to result in is the establishment of a Microsoft Innovation Center at uh, the Technology Park Malay. So some of the concerns, uh, as someone completely outside the standard setting process, both at the national level and at the international level, I'm not as fortunate as Bob to be implicated at both levels. Um, I'm, I'm quoting a study from Digital Standards Organization, which is looking at the link between per capita GDP and uh, the ISO OXML vote. And the findings are that the average GDP per capita of countries who voted for OXML proposal is significantly lower than the GDP per capita of those who voted against it. So what you can see is that there is weak institutions in countries with low GDP. and in many ways, they will get easily influenced by uh, advocacy campaigns launched by uh, various stakeholders in the process. Another study from Electronic Frontier uh, Finland, I was discussing this with Bob, and he was saying that we can't really trust this study because they use the Transparency International Corruption Index. In many ways, I remember the poor American student who was arrested for trying to sell his vote. But uh, as you know, it's very common for senators to sell their vote in the US context. So I'm not sure how uh, reliable such a correlation is. But the result of this study says that corrupt countries were more likely to support the OXML document format. The third concern I have is that uh, through this business of RAND, uh, talk about standards that use RAND gives normative sanction to software patents in countries that don't give constitutional sanction to software patents. Moving on, just uh, as somebody who knows very little about the standards uh, setting process, it seems strange that a country like Trinidad and Tobago with just 1.5 million people get the one vote, and then a country like China, which has over a billion people, also gets only one vote. So, I'm wondering, is this really representative of the consumer base of the standard that's being discussed? Um, moving on to my fifth point, uh, we must remember that uh, developing countries have very limited uh, resources, and they have many battles to fight at international policy setting and policy formulation fora. So they have to choose their battles depending upon their local national priorities. So it would be good if international standard setting organizations had a protocol for remote participation. Again, just to echo the point that Bob made, uh, it would be good if the standard setting organizations came, uh, came together and formulated a common definition around the term open standards and then tagged committees and standards as either open or RAND or proprietary so that when governments decide to adopt standards, they know what they're getting into. And then again, to echo another point that Bob made, uh, not only do we need more 
fin financial transparency, but also uh, process transparency and process simplicity at both the national and international level, especially for what he calls civic standards that impact digital citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunil. Um, next up, we'll have um, Ashish Gautam from IBM. Um, I think um, Sunil once again raised the issue um, from a developing country perspective or emerging country or however you want to define that. Um, and the major issues are around weak institutions, uh, countries that are vulnerable, that might uh, lack technical and other resources. Um, the issues around IPR uh, were once again raised. And um, I think deal with um, uh, open standards and intellectual property rights is becoming uh, something that needs to be uh, dealt with. So we will raise the issue of representation, I think, as well, which was quite a, a, an interesting perspective. Um, the use of technology to allow uh, countries that can't afford uh, to participate uh, physically in these processes was uh, once again raised. And then I think, uh, again, emphasizing the need for much more transparent, legitimate, and um, well-established processes um, was highlighted by Sunil. Uh, Ashish, you may carry on. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can I have the presentation slides on? Okay, can I switch it over? No? for open standards for IBM India. Uh, 